today I want to talk about a simple way. I'm going to give you very simple from a from a actually a passage that's pretty deep, uh, uh, Romans chapter 10, and we're going to look at a simple way to share your faith. And um, you know, do you know how to share your faith? Do you know how to tell somebody else what you believe? Do you know what you believe? That might help too. So um, I want to start with this illustration first. Do you know what this important Florida item is? Sand bucket? Nice try. What? What is it? It's a big gulp, almost. Popcorn container from Disney World. See the mouse on it? So what you need to understand is this is vital if you ever go and visit one of the parks. Especially if you bring grandchildren and you are not enjoying yourself, this will make your life wonderful. Here's why. The first time it cost a million dollars to get it filled. But after that, it's two dollars. And you can take it home and wash it and go back and bring it with you again. And they charge you, and that's after tax, two dollars. You can eat popcorn all day long. Even if you're miserable in line, you can just stand in Dumbo. <laughs> Delicious. Now, let me tell you something I have learned, though, about the Magic Kingdom, Disney World, Epcot, and all of those places. We have seasonal passes. Not only do we have seasonal passes, we have weekday seasonal passes. It is the lamest, cheapest passes you can get at Disney World. But I thought, why would I get a weekend pass? You people work me to death every weekend. So we go during the week. So um, I got uh, I, our girls together. Um, we got uh, Jenna and Elise. And Kristen and I decided, hey, this is a perfect day. We're going to go to Disney. This was last year. So we got our passes together and went to the park. And as we drove in, because, you know, the initial thing when you drive in is how busy is the park. And so as we drove in, we thought, huh, yeah, it's not too bad. And we got on the monorail and we we're headed over and I could see the Magic Kingdom. You can already hear the music and you can already smell the popcorn. And as we're, which is awesome, by the way. So anyway, so and they actually make it there, unlike movie theaters that are pretending they do and then throwing old popcorn at you. But anyway, so <laughs> it's true. It's true. Absolutely true. Anyway, so, um, so we're going in, and I can see that there's hardly anybody in the park. And I'm like, this is going to be the most magical day. And you can hear the music as you get off the tram. And we go up, and our passes don't work. I'm like, oh, no. So, so they said, well, you need to go to the booth over there and talk to somebody from the So we go over there, and the lady says, uh, um, this is a blackout day. Your passes don't work today. Now, I was, I got to admit, I was hoping for a little Disney magic at that point, like, but it's okay, we're going to let you in. But I know if they did that, then everybody else would want that too. So we, I would love to tell you that we went home, but we went to one of those outlet malls next. <laughs> anyway, so, so here's the deal. You don't get to make the rules for Disney. Did you know it? You don't get to tell them, but I know I only bought this one, but you should give me this. By the way, we did a concert last week where we had VIP tickets that were over $100, and we had general admission tickets that were $30, and we had somebody come to us and say, you should let me into the VIP. Do you have a VIP ticket? No. Well, then no, you don't get, they lost their minds. We live in a world where we think we're entitled, where we think we deserve something, and we think I get to decide what the rules are about everything. Does this surprise you? But you have to understand, as a pastor, I deal with the same thing. People come to me and they say, uh, you know, I think there should be many paths to God. I go, wow, that's, that's really good that you think that. It's not true, but I, but I think that's right. I think that if you're a good person, you go to heaven. Wow, that, that's really good. I like that. That's a good theory. But you don't get to make the rules. And I don't get to make the rules. By the way, if I got to make the rules for Disney, it would be do whatever Eric Brookins wants. Right? And, and most of us have had children who think that the rules should be do it. Right? <laughs> yeah, that was funny. That was the best reaction yet. Oh, oh. Because you all thought of that child and it made you groan. I heard the groan. It was out, outward. 
You didn't, you didn't keep it inside. Hopefully they're not sitting next to you. Jesus, in the book of John, says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Now, I would love it if somehow in the Greek I could figure out a way that Jesus didn't say he was the way. I would love if he said, if you follow me or if you're just a nice person, if you follow me and you do this, or if you follow anybody who says nice things, but Jesus didn't say that. And at that point, Jesus was either a lunatic, as C.S. Lewis said, a liar, or he was who he said he was. And as a believer, we have a choice when it comes to that. Are we going to believe what Jesus said, or are we going to kind of make our own religion? Are we going to make our own religion based on what we think feels good or what we like? My religion would include bacon. Other religions don't include bacon. I worry about those people. Of course you're starting wars when you don't believe in bacon. I mean, just that alone would make me angry. So do you see what I mean? If we all made our own rules. Listen, if we all went by our preferences, Dave would never finish the music on Sundays because you would all have a different song you like. But it's not about preference. It's about what does the Bible say? What does the Bible say is truth? What does it say is accurate? And, and so today we're going to talk about this idea. If you're a Christian, do you know how to share your faith with others? And then secondly, this passage is, is, talks about do you support other people so that they can share their faith? Because here's the truth. We are not in this deal alone. It's not your job to share your faith with everybody. It's not my job to share my faith with everybody that you know. God's put you where you are. And we work as a team to help people find their way home. And then finally today, we're going to talk about how you've been given a gift. And one of the things that makes us want to share our faith is because we've been given such a gift that we should want to share it. I mean, if you had the cure for coronavirus today, and that's not a beer-based virus, by the way, for some of you. Somebody posted, I'm not going to get that. I'm immune. But if you had the cure for it and you refused to share it with anybody, what kind of person would you be? If you're a Christian, you have the greatest gift in the world. Why wouldn't you share that? So let's look at Romans chapter 10. Number one, first we want to surrender to, look at this word, surrender to his righteousness. Surrender to his righteousness. The word his is there in the notes. Here we go. Brothers and sisters, my heart's desire and prayer to God for the Israelites is that they may be saved. Time out. Okay, so here's what's happening in this passage. Paul grew up. He's not only a Roman citizen, which is awesome, gave him a lot of rights. He's also, he also grew up Jewish. Not only did he grow up Jewish, he became a Pharisee, not just a Pharisee. He became the leader of the Pharisees, so much so that in the book of Acts, you see Paul at the first deacon uh, uh, murder. Paul's holding the coats because he thought what the Christians were doing were wrong. He was there encouraging, yes, throw rocks at him and kill him. Paul, a murderer of Christians. Now, how would you like to have that guy come visit your church, right? So you can imagine what it was like for Paul to visit a church. And so, and so Paul, who has that, is on the road to Emmaus. And all of a sudden, he sees the light, literally, And when God speaks to him, he says, why are you persecuting me? And he's like, well, what do you mean? I'm doing, basically, I'm doing what you want me to. And most people think, why would that happen to Paul and no one else? Is because I believe that God saw the sincerity of Paul. He really thought he was doing God's will. And then he realized, I'm not. But here he is now as a believer and a Jew realizing that so many of his Jewish friends, so many of his Jewish family have rejected Jesus for a specific reason. And then he goes into that. For I can testify about them that they are zealous for God, but their zeal is not based on knowledge since they did not know the righteousness of God, listen to this, and sought to establish their own, they did not submit to God's righteousness. What he's saying is, they tried to make it to God the way they wanted to. So their way was to practice the law. We'll do these religious things outwardly, even though we'll never do it inwardly. So outwardly, they were doing the right... You're like, it's like the friend that you help move. 
Will you help me move? <laughs> yeah, looking forward to it. Right? Outwardly, they were doing the right things, but not inwardly. You ever do the right things or say the right things to somebody and you're totally lying? That's what they were doing. And so Paul's like, hey, they did these things, but they basically made their own rules, their own righteousness. Like people who say, hey, I think you just need to be sincere. It doesn't matter what you believe as long as you're sincere. Well, I'm glad your pilot doesn't think that. It doesn't matter how you land a plane as long as you're sincere about it. How about backwards, right? All right. Christ is the culmination of the law so that there may be righteousness for everyone who believes. By the way, I'm going to talk in a few minutes about what the law is now because of Christ. And then a few verses later, the, probably most of you have heard this one. If you declare with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it's with your heart you believe and are justified that we're justified just as if I've never sinned. And it's with your mouth that you profess your faith and are saved. This is one of the reasons why when somebody comes to me and says, I want to give my life to Christ, I say, okay, here's what you can pray. And they're like, you're not going to pray for me? I'm like, well, I'm going to pray for you, but I'm going to let you pray. And if they say to me, I'm not ready to do that, I say, well, then you're probably not ready to give your life to Christ. <gasps> what do you mean? Well, if you're not ready to say with your mouth in front of me by myself that you're going to give your life to Christ, you're probably not willing to do that for anybody else. It's really mean. I'm a mean, horrible person. As scripture says, anyone who believes him will never be put to shame. By the way, a Jewish person who heard this letter read in Rome would be offended by that because he refers to the passage in Isaiah, which is, is basically telling us anyone, not just the Jews, anyone. And then it continues, who believes will never be put to shame. And that's where the title of this sermon is. For there is no difference between Jew and Gentile. The same Lord is Lord of all and richly blesses all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. So everything the Jews practiced in the Old Testament pointed towards Jesus. It wasn't the sacrifice of the lamb that saved them. And somebody asked me last night, do they still do that? Not in the same way. There are some Jews who are trying to reestablish the way they did that, but they don't. They used to have to do sacrificial lambs, but the lamb was not what took away their sin. It was the Messiah to come. It was pointing towards Jesus. And so it was this outward thing. So if you wanted to share your faith with someone else, and I should have put these on the screen, but I didn't. So here's the question for you today. Do I surrender every area of my life to him? Because the truth is, if we're not careful, we try to please God by our righteousness. When instead, we should just surrender. God, I surrender that area to you. I surrender that sin to you. I surrender that thought to you. I surrender my life to you. God, I want to do what you want me to do. So what does it mean to be saved? It's the ABCs. It's very simple. <clears throat> and this verse talks about it. A, you have to admit. Admit that you're a sinner and that you're willing to turn from sin. Now, a lot of people, I've never Ever Well, one time. If I ask somebody, are you a sinner? Which typically you don't even have to say sinner, but they get it. You know, are you messed up? I've never had anybody go, nope, I'm perfect. One time I had a guy tell me that, but I knew him. And little did he know, I knew he was a sinner. But anyway, so, so the truth is when I ask people, are you a sinner? The best responses I've gotten are, I'm good at it. I'm a professional. You know, right? They know that they fail. Hardly anybody in our world knows or feels like they have it all together. Okay? But then do you want to do the second part? Do you want to repent of it? Do you want to change? Or do you just like living in your sin? By the way, if you're a Christian and you're pursuing sin, 1 John says maybe you're not a Christian. Because it's not, the, it's not the righteousness that comes from you that saves you. But if you enjoy pursuing unrighteousness, then maybe you're not really a Christian. Well, Eric, you're judging me. No, you, you be honest with God about that. If you have no desire to pursue the things of God, then maybe you're not pursuing the things of God. It's a shocker. B stands for believe. A person must believe that Jesus is God's son and God sent Jesus to pay the penalty for sin. That's what that talks about there in Romans chapter 10. 
It's also John 3, 16. God so loved the world that he sent his only son, that whoever believes in him. Now that word belief, this is where we get hung up sometimes because we don't understand. That word belief is not what you think about when you think about belief. When you think about belief, you think, well, I believe in Abraham Lincoln. I believe in whatever. I believe in my football team, unless you're the Dolphins, and then you're just sad all the time, right? I believe. What does that mean? Believe means put your faith in. So let me show you what that is. So, so I can know about this chair. I can know how a chair works. I can see other illustrations of chairs. But I don't really trust this chair. I don't really put my faith in this chair until... I'm willing to rest in the chair until I'm willing to say, I, I give my weight. <laughs> I give my too much weight to the chair, right? Right? And, er and they ever look at a chair and it's suspect? So you kind of do the, by the way, it's okay if you want to come to Christ. It, listen, it's okay not to have a blind faith. You don't have to just walk in and go, well, I guess I'll just, it's okay to ask questions. It's okay to read. It's okay to discover. It's okay to say, I'm not sure about that. It's okay. But at some point, if you're going to be a Christian, you have to have faith. You have to say, God, I trust you. By the way, almost anything you believe requires faith at some point. Because at some point, you're going to get to the why question that you can't answer. Well, why is this? Oh. And if you've had a three-year-old, you've done that deal before. And now we have the internet, so you can look it up and still not have a good answer for them. Why is the sky blue? Well, Google says it has to do with the other. Well, then why is that? Have some popcorn, right? Here we go. C, you guys are all going to have popcorn this afternoon. Over Redenbacher would be my recommendation. All right, C. C stands for confess. A person must confess his or her faith in Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord. Basically, Savior and Lord means he's in charge. God, I put you in charge of my life. And so are you willing to do that? And if you want to share with somebody, if they said to you, Hey, I want to give my life to Christ. What do I do? The ABCs. And there's verses that go along with any, all these. I wish I had more time today. This is three sermons in one. Number two, share your faith and support those who share. Support those who share. Over the years during football season, now this is funny, during football season, every week, someone has had a football shirt on in this room. Every week. Every week. I didn't see any last night. We had a pretty full service last night. I don't see any, anybody wearing a football team shirt today. I do see some Surfside shirts. That's good to see. All right. So here's the deal. You and I, have you ever been shopping for a sports team shirt? They're the most expensive shirts on earth. The NFL says, you're going to give me this much. So those of you, you know, if you're like me, you go to a thrift store. I mean, you can find dolphin shirts all day long in the thrift <laughs> store. People just, I'm not buying that anymore. Right? Because they change players every week. Same thing with the Magic. Anyway, so you just buy, you know, I still have a Dwight Howard jersey. I'm like, yeah, that'll work. And um, anyway, so um, here's the deal. But there's people who spend $100, $150 on a shirt who can't put tires on their car. Right? We all know that person, right? They can't take care of themselves. But man, they're at the Daytona 500 today. I mean, you look at their car in the parking lot and you're like, you should have got tires. <laughs> Don't judge them. Somebody got money giving them the tickets. Anyway, so here's the deal. So, so where's your priority? We tend to support the things that matter to us. People will say, well, I don't have money for that. Let me, let me read what Paul says here. How then can they call on the one they haven't believed in? And how can they believe in the one whom they have not heard? And how can they hear without somebody preaching to them? And how can anyone preach unless they are sent? And what is this talking about? It's talking about supported. Paul was supported as a missionary by churches. Did you know that? Did you know Jesus was supported? And did you know Jesus was supported primarily by women in the church? Did you know that? There's a lady named Lydia. My daughter's named Lydia. Supported by women who sponsored and helped and funded so they could do. That's why Judas could steal from the treasury, right? Because they took a collection. You never knew that about Jesus, did you? So they're passing bread and they're passing the plate, I guess. I don't know how that worked. Anyway, so. But how, and then it says this. As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. But not all the Israelites accepted the good news. For Isaiah says, Lord, who's believed our message? Consequently... Faith comes from hearing the message, and the message is heard through the word about Christ. So here he says, how can anybody preach unless they're sent? Two things you should do. Number one, 
you should share your faith with other people. So the question is, do I share my faith story? Let me tell you how to share your faith story very simply. Where I was before Jesus, how I found Christ, and what God's done in my life. That's how you share your faith story. Now, it doesn't even have to be that broad. It can be as simple as what God's doing in your life now. Now, please, 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 don't be an aggressive, in-your-face jerk and say it's because of your faith. Screaming at people is not show God's love to people. Going up to people and going, hey, I know you don't know me. Are you going to hell? It's not a good start. <laughs> right? So, so how do you do? Primarily, this is going to be done out of relationships with people. You should never talk to people about your faith unless you've prayed for them. I don't care if it's five seconds before you talk to them. Maybe you just met them at a baseball game. Maybe you were sitting next to them. Maybe they brought something and you thought, huh? A lot of times, I'll be honest with you, a lot of people, I get opportunities to share their faith when they're going through a hard time in life. They start saying what's going on. I say, well, you know, what's your goal? What's your purpose in life? Purpose? Yeah, what matters to you? I don't know, money, being happy. Like, you, how's that working for you? And most people come to Christ in a hard time. I will tell you this too, though. I have a good friend who was in the peak of life. Convertible car, driving around Brevard County, doing great, lots of money, real popular. And one of his friends said to him, what are you doing all this for? And he kind of went, I don't, I don't know. So he drove to First Baptist Church of Merritt Island one night, saw that they were having church, pulled in. Peter Lord was speaking, and that night he gave his life to Christ. He's a Christian to this day. That was 30 years ago. So you never know what you might say to somebody, how you might encourage somebody that might lead them to faith in Christ. Can you share your faith story? Can you let people know? It doesn't have to be an in-your-face jerky thing, okay? So that's, that's the opposite of what you want. By the way, Jesus sat with the woman at the well. He didn't sit down with her and start with, go and sin no more. He ended the conversation that way, but he started with, can I have a drink? Number two, do I financially support those who share their faith? Now, here's where I'm going to talk about money. So just buckle up. If you've been at our church for six months, you've probably not heard me talk about money at all. But here, I'm going to tell you, first of all, I have no idea what anyone in our church gives. Anyone who gives online, I have no idea. Unless you tell me, I have no idea. Please don't tell me. But, but I have no idea. And that's on purpose. I don't want to ever judge you or think you to think I judge you. So if I'm looking at you and you think, oh, he knows I'm giving or he knows I'm not giving, don't worry about it. I had a lady one week come up to me and go, you said that because you knew I wasn't giving. And I'm like, I had no idea you weren't giving. And she turned white. Oh, didn't know you didn't know. <laughs> so I'm like, oh. Okay, so, so here's the deal. Do a budget. The most important thing you can do is be a good steward of everything God's given you. Dave Ramsey has budgets online. You can get them for free. You can Google them. You can Google but Dave Ramsey budget, and they'll, they'll be a sheet. And when you look at the Dave Ramsey sheet, it, the first thing it talks about is income, and then the, the very next thing is giving. Why? Because if you don't prioritize giving, you'll just give God leftovers. you just give God, oh, if I have something left. So you'll do all the things you want to do, and then you'll say, I'll give God what I have left over. You'll play, pray for your sports team and play for your sports team and give to your sports team and then go, I got a couple bucks. So you'll tip God, right? And so budget it. And you're like, well, Eric, I can't give. Oh, listen, start with something. I don't care if you give 0.0175%. It doesn't, I don't know anyway. It doesn't matter to me, between you and God. But start somewhere. Budget giving to causes. And it doesn't just have to be our church. You may not even be a member here, but you still need to hear this message. Give to places where God's word is being shared. Even as a church, listen, we could hire more staff if we didn't give so much. We give to other organizations that help people. We give to the port ministry out of Port Canaveral that is helping sailors from all over the world come to faith in Christ. We give to missionaries through the cooperative program all over the world. We're helping to sponsor three churches this year, a Hispanic church in O'Galley and, and a church in Melbourne and a church in Sebastian. Why? Because. We're supposed to give to help others to be sent. Places we can't go, places we wouldn't go. So that we can help them find their way home. And I always imagine myself in heaven watching people come up to me and go, Hey, you gave. There was a song that was actually made about that. You gave, and I'm here because you gave. And I always remember that. And so, listen, you deal with that with God and you. It's not between you and me. It's not between you and the church. It's between you and the Lord. But listen, I want to encourage you. Please budget Please budget. If you go to Disney World, they will pick your pocket before you leave there. 
So budget before you go there. Budget before you go everywhere. The world is trying to rob you. So you give to God first and then figure out the rest, okay? I want to encourage you to do that. And, and budget, and budget. That's the most important thing. How would I do? Was that a good budget talk? Would you like that? Is that all right? You can nod. All right. So there we go. All right. My own mother, who has been in church almost her whole life, she remembers somebody picking her up for church when she was six years old. She would have never gone to church. Her parents didn't go. They actually laughed at her when she gave her life to Christ. I don't know if you knew that. When my mom gave her life to Christ, her parents made fun of her. Can you imagine? And then my mom taught Sunday school. It was a, until she was in her 70s, she actually headed the children's ministry at her church in Sebring. That's awesome. Some of you think you're too old to work in the children's ministry, and you're just in your 50s. And you're just wrong. Anyway, so um, <laughs> that second part was supposed to stay inside, and it, it spurted. So, so uh, she said she did not know the thing I'm about to tell you. So I'm going to tell you real quick, but I want this to sink in. Here we go. Why don't we obey all the Old Testament laws? Why don't we? And my mom said, I don't know. She said, I knew it was okay to eat bacon. I didn't really ever ask why. And she grew up, she grew up that where they, they would put fat on stuff thinking it was healthy. Did you know that? There's an old commercial. There's an old commercial. I listen to that classic radio sometime, and they talk about lard is good for you. I'm like, what? All right. So first of all, the ceremonial law. Ceremonial laws are specifically related to Israel's worship. The purpose was to point to Jesus. So these are things like sacrificing, even some of the, even some of the rituals that they did. These are no longer necessary after Jesus' death and resurrection. Jesus was accused of breaking these. Number two, civil laws. They were specific for their time, and some of the civil laws freak us out. Typically, the civil laws are the ones that people come, okay, pastor, I found this passage in the Old Testament. Would you tell me what, why would they do this? This is terrible. Why would they do this terrible thing? Well, in some cases, it's because they were in war, and in war, you have different rules than when you're not in war. If you're in the military, you have different rules than if you're not in the military, so, you know, if you're here and you yell at me, no big deal. If I'm your commander and we're in the military, guess what? <laughs> big trouble, right? Right? Whole different world. So you have to understand civil laws. The principles still apply, but not specific laws. And then finally, the moral laws. Those are laws that apply all times. How to live, how to treat others, how to obey God. The Ten Commandments express these laws. And there's a few different verses. That's just a few of the verses that are in your notes. Matthew 10, Acts 15, Romans 1, Ephesians 5, 1 Corinthians 5. All those are in your notes. All right. Number three. So we surrender his righteousness. We share our faith. Number three, seek the humility that follows acceptance. Now, I'm going to try not to take you too far out, but we're going to talk about oranges on this next one. Try to explain it. Because it's going to, when I start talking in this passage, you're going to go, what? And then we'll bring it back. I'm talking to you Gentiles. That's most of us, by the way. In as much as I'm the apostle to the Gentiles. I take pride in my ministry in the hope that I may arouse my own people to envy and save some of them. Basically, I want to make the Jews jealous so they'll come to Christ. They'll see the joy that's in your life, and they'll come to Christ too. For if their rejection about reconciliation to the world, what will their acceptance from life from the dead? If the part of the dough offered as first fruits is holy, the whole batch is holy. If the root is holy, so are the branches. If some of the branches have been broken off, and you, though a wild olive shoot, that's us. If you're a Gentile, you're a wild olive shoot. Wild olive shoot. Have been grafted in among the others, and now share the sap from the olive root. Do not consider yourself to be superior to those other branches. Basically, don't feel like you're superior to other believers, whether they're Jewish or anything else. No matter what their color, their ethnicity. Boy, that's a tough word to say on Sunday morning when you've had four cups of coffee. If you do, consider this. You don't support the root. The root supports you. Basically, who in the world do you think you are? Just because of the color of your skin or your ethnic. Yeah, if, yeah, that. Boy, what is wrong with that word today in my mouth? Ethnic. Say it again. Yeah, that word. Man. Just because where you came from doesn't mean you're any better or worse than anybody else, all right? Just because they have a southern accent and you don't doesn't make you better or them better. Just because they talk slow doesn't mean they're dumber. Right? Branches were broken off. Why? So I could be grafted and granted, but they were broken off because of unbelief. And you stand, listen, by faith. So don't be arrogant, but tremble. For God did not spare the natural branches. He will not spare you either. Here's what Paul's saying. All of us are like that orange branch. And there's the original tree, the original root. 
And God comes and takes us and puts us in, and we get all of the benefits of Christ. We get the fruits of the Spirit, love and joy and peace. Patience, which I'm working on when people drive in the left lane at 30 miles an hour. What is wrong with you, right? Patience. Kindness. By the way, I had an exercise this morning. Somebody was driving below the speed limit on a two-lane road on my way here. And as I was driving, I, I, I was praying about it. And I said, Lord, I, I really want to pass these people. And I felt like he said, no, you need to learn patience, so just slow down. So I went six miles below the speed limit. 24 miles an hour. Do you know what it's like to drive 24 miles an hour for four miles? It was great. You know why? Because I said, Lord, if you want me to drive slower, I'll drive slower. And so we, we have those things when we're grafted in. So we can't be proud of, of that we're somehow better than somebody else. Listen, when you see somebody and they're messed up, what you could think should think is, God, thank you for your grace. Help me help them to find their way to the root. Help me to help them to find their way home. No matter how wild they are. Get the wild olive root. You got it? No matter how wild they are, and some of you were wild children before God got a hold of you, you know, God help me find my way home. Your last question is this, do I recognize the salvation I've been given by God? Because if you realize the difference in your life be between now and the time you gave your life to Christ, if you see that God's maturing you, if you see that he's been adding fruit to your life, that yes, you do have more joy than you used to have then you're going to want other people to have the same thing. Your friends who are miserable pursuing everything, you're going to start praying for them. You're going to look for opportunities and say, God, would you help me to know and give me a time to share with them the faith you've given me? And let me just throw this at you. For many of you, your hardest ministry, you're here today, your hardest ministry is your family because they know you. Typically, you don't have to say a lot. Just live it. Let them know it. I'm not saying to deny your faith. Let them know it. But you don't have to be in their faith. They're watching you. They're watching to see what you do. And you just pray, God, bring that wild olive shoot home. And help them find their way home to you. Do you know how to share your faith? I hope today we gave you some keys to do that. And I hope you'll be willing to not only share, but to, but to encourage and to give to others who share their faith. And to realize the gift you've been given. If you're here today and you've never given your life to Christ, you can do that today. We're going to have a time of prayer in just a second and then a closing song. We don't do a formal invitation where people come up during the song, but I'll be here after the service. And you can say, Eric, I want to give my life to Christ. Maybe you're here today and the truth is you've forgotten some of these things. It's okay. Ask God to help you to grow up. Ask him to fill you with his spirit, the fruit of the spirit. If you're struggling with one of those fruits today, maybe on the way here you struggle with patience or joy or love. Say, God, would you fill me again with your spirit today? Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for your word. I thank you for your power. Lord, I thank you that when we surrendered our lives to you, you change us, not because we do a bunch of things, but because your spirit in us changes what we desire. And so, Lord, it makes us better people. Lord, make us more like you every day. Father, I pray we could love unlovable people. Lord, that we could show those in our lives that sometimes test our patience, that, Father, you're pouring more love and more joy into our lives, that we would be an example to them, that they would want what we have because we've been grafted into you. Lord, I pray for that one today that's struggling because they've been walking away from you, that today they would know they are welcome home. Like the prodigal son, Lord, you've been waiting for them and today would be the day that they can come home to you and surrender to you. So do that this morning. Lord, thank you for these moments. Now bless our giving, Lord. I pray it would be used not only here, but around the world to help people to come to know you. In Jesus' name, amen.